Imagine going to work in the morning, being handed a ticking bob. You're going to keep that in your pocket for the next nine hours, <coughs> knowing that at any second now it can go off, go off, and there's someone who has a cardiac arrest. And yeah, the alarm goes off. You have 120 seconds to get to that position in the hospital where the alarm is. I'll switch it off. You hit the button on the wall, run to the emergency elevator, and you're quiet with your colleague putting your gloves on. And when you enter the scene in a different ward where the cardiac arrest is happening, it's often very chaotic. But when the, the crash team comes and take over and start doing their things, it actually goes quiet. A paradox? No. It's the result of a well-rehearsed strategy for the situation. We know that we need to preserve energy, we need to be very focused, CPR is quite hard, and we need to be able to hear what the other person is saying and to read the instruments. And I think that if you're able to create a good sound environment like that, in that situation, one of the most stressful ones, I'm sure you can do it anywhere in the hospital, don't you think? And in this situation, there's always someone taking the lead, saying, give one milligram of adrenaline, and the other one says, one milligram given, so that we have clear communication. And we always have one person designated to take care of the patient's family or other patients that witness the, the cardiac arrest. We take them aside, they're stressed, get a blanket, maybe some warm drinks, and they're not left alone. They need to feel safe and secure, knowing that someone is seeing them and someone can help them. So when I reflect over the healthcare, um, I try to look at it this way. What is the purpose of the whole institution? Well, it's a twofold. We have the patients, of course, and what do we do for them? We try to cure them, heal them, or ease their suffering. And we're very good at doing this. I remember my very first day at work in the CCU unit, that's the coronary care unit, intensive care for really uh, uh, sick people. I graduated in 1996 on a Friday. I started there on the Monday. And I sat uh, during my first report, I sat at the CCU uh, <coughs> monitor table with all the different heart rhythms going. We were five or six people. The previous staff was given a report and there was like ding, 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 dong, ding, ding, dong. And no one did anything. They kept talking and they didn't even look at the monitors. And I got more and more nervous thinking like, oh my God, are they dying? <laughs> So after a while, you know, first day at the job, I said, uh, listen, sorry guys, but you see the alarms, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, they, had, they were in full control of the alarms and they knew exactly what was happening. And a few months down the road, I could sit on that chair as well without jumping uh, half a meter in the seat. But I have tried to bring with me that feeling of insecurity and being unsafe. Because what I felt that very first day is exactly what the family and relatives feel when they're in the room with the patient. And the patient, if the patient is well enough. And I, I can really connect to that. Like, are they watching? Can the nurses see it? Why are they not doing anything? And when the nurse comes in to do something and you want to say, oh, did you see the 10 previous alarms? And that insecure feeling is something that we really do recognize and we try to comfort or ease the pain of the family and the patient. If we see that they're very stressed, we do turn off the monitors when we can, we turn down sounds and alarms when we can and uh, otherwise we will explain that okay this is going to beep a lot but it's because this and that and don't worry we know it and he's not or she's not dying of it. And the other aspects of healthcare is for the staff. You know, we have a staff that's going to be there for 30 or 40 years, probably, in their career. And uh, the question is, what kind of possibilities do we give the staff to do their part of what the institution is there for? That is to good, give good, high-quality care. Do we give them 
the opportunity to give that or not. Well, we've heard here today that the patients are suffering sleep deprivation. Um, we've seen a lot of statistics and we've also seen that many of the staff issues have been brought up. The lack of concentration, the risk of committing medical errors. And this is something that we, we need to focus on even more, I think. So we need to find strategies in the way of handling this. The problem is that we have a brain. And that brain is connected to two ears, thank God. And the hearing was created for us to be um, a protection. It was pr to protect us from dangers. Is it fight or flight? Or is it safe? And that's a fantastic built-in thing we have, isn't it? It's your own little watchdog. And our body is supposed to be able to handle that from time to time, but not the whole time. Not for full nine hours. You have to be able to zoom down and, and uh, digest so-called these uh, cortisols and adrenaline. Otherwise, we know that in the long run, we are going to develop diseases. And we don't want that. We want high qualified staff to stay uh, where they are. And we don't want to lose them when they're getting senior. And we've been talking a little bit about the ICU today. And uh, I would just like to tell something uh, about when you're in uh, ICU or operating theatres for the first time, possibly during your training. The golden rule is that it has to be quiet when we sedate the patient, put the patient to deep sleep for the OR. If you drop a scissor at that moment, you'll be kicked out. Because we know if we disturb that very delicate moment, the whole experience for the patient can be very, very unpleasant. And it's the same thing actually when we wake them up, but going to sleep is the most crucial. And one of the most vulnerable groups are the one we've been talking about, the ICU patients, intensive care unit patients. They are at their most vulnerable state. Their bodily functions are held up with machines and people and drugs, but their hearing is probably still on. And uh, I know Shastin showed some figures there about how many of the people admitted to the ICU have a risk of developing ICU delirium. And, th and that's a high figure, somewhere around 30, and depending on where you put the lines, you know, 30, 40 percent. And we know that out of these people, we have a higher mortality, higher morbidity, and a higher increase of cost, and a lot of suffering for those patients. These hallucinations are not nice. So we're looking forward to the result of the Boros study. So what can we do then? Well, we can go back to where our ears were created, out in nature. This is a sound that most of us like. Oh, he's a happy fella. <laughs> and uh, this is the sound that when we walk in the forest, oh, uh, it's very loud. When we walk in the forest and hear this, yeah, it, everything's fine. But if uh, it stops and it goes quiet in the forest, then we're like, oh, what's going on here? There's a predator somewhere. Am I the prey? Is it safe? No. It's a very unnatural feeling. So knowing that we uh, like the sounds of nature is, uh, is good because we're smart people. If we can't move the Mount Mohammed to the mountain, we mo move the mountain to Mohammed. So bring the sounds of nature in. And we use that a lot. Every spa you go to, they have like, you know, waves and pouring water and tapping rain and leaves. Uh, and it makes us feel safe, secure. And also beautiful music, of course, makes us feel good. So we bring it in. We put heads the headsets on people when they're in the MR at least the adult ones. And uh, when we do an, uh, a neuro intervention uh, on the table with a, a patient that is awake, we play relaxing music in the room because we're actually up here doing things and if they move their head, they, that could cause damage. So we want them to be calm and secure. But we're smart people. We know that, okay, we respond well to sound. How can we use that? Well, these are the sounds that 
uh, humans are not used to and they're going to react to really, really quick and a lot. And that is alarm sounds. Carefully chosen with the right pitch, tone and strength to get your alertness going straight away. And when I um, worked in the CCU, you sit in a, you saw the display before, that's pretty common that you have six or eight rooms and then a, an area in the middle with different teams working. And you have all the monitors in the middle from your eight patients and possibly 12 of them out on the ward. So it's going the whole time. So you're sitting here working in your computer and doing concentrated work and the machine would go dong, dong, dong. Dong, 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 dong. That's a battery that's going to be flat in two minutes. And it's going to go on like that for two minutes. <laughs> and you can't switch it off. So whatever you do, you have to leave it, go and change the battery to get rid of it. Very annoying. But this machine can actually give an alarm up to 200 times per hour. And you're sitting there working. The sound comes. And you mightn't, you mightn't look because it's the, the smallest one, the dong but your brain reacts to it. But the dong dong, you have to think about it, look, evaluate, make a decision if you're gonna do something or not, go and do it or not, come back into your, your uh, concentrated work. And I don't know, how long will that take? 15 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe longer. And I'm not a mathematician, but an hour has 60 minutes, let's say 30 seconds to get back, 200 times in the hour. It's not going to work. And you do it for eight hours and 12 years. So when I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, I hear the dong dong. <laughs> so um, does patient have sound memories? Yes, they do actually. Uh, one of uh, the people in here, my colleague Sarah, she was presenting at a similar situation as this and someone in the audience stood up and said, um, you know, we had a patient and that patient said, why did you keep playing Beethoven? And they was like, we don't play Beethoven. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. All the time. Every day. And they're like, what? And this patient uh, was uh, quite sick and had a tube down the stomach, so it was tube fed. And um, to push uh, the food forward in the tube, it's like a little circle that takes half a lap or so that says, da uh, dum, da dum, da dum. That was Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, one of the most famous uh, compositions in the world. And this was written by uh, Beethoven in 1804 to 1808. He was in his mid-30s, on his way to go deaf. Fantastic composer. But I'm not sure that I would like to listen to this uh, for my breakfast, 30 minutes, my lunch, 30 minutes, and my dinner, 30 minutes. Neither would you, I think. So the constructor of this machine, I'm sure, didn't have a clue that this is going to be associated with Beethoven. They just constructed something really smart. So it's, I think it's up to us, the people on the floor, to really identify uh, what kind of sounds are we struggling with and when can we go back to the manufacturer and ask for something else. Because that's not going to happen by itself. The manufacturer is not going to go look for this problem and find a solution. And I know that in Innsbruck, uh, now in Austria, they did talk a lot about what we heard previous today, that can we uh, instead use alarm with light? Can we use vibration? Can we use something else? And I have a great idea for uh, the cardiac world. And um, because when you put the telemetry on someone, uh, you can have different heart rhythms, like a, a normal rhythm is a sinus rhythm between 50 and 100. That's, that's a healthy suite. And then you have all other kind of rhythms, set kind of. An atrial fibrillation looks like this, uh, and so on. So 
you put the machine on, and as soon as I deviate from this perfect rhythm, there's going to be an alarm. And that's kind of stupid, because it gives us 200 alarms per hour, because we're not machines, we don't work like that. If I have atrial fibrillation, I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but it's a fast, irregular heartbeat. I could have been fully medicated, fully treated, and this is a chronic condition for me. And I'm in there because of something else. Then my idea is, why don't we record your own rhythm and have that as a baseline? And when it deviates from my rhythm, then you can have an alarm. So anyone in the medical industry now? Write a patent contract with me. <laughs> so, but it's not going to happen by itself. And I, I can tell you a story when it really, we really had good results. You know when you do resuscitation, CPR, with patients, uh, we're quite ineffective, even if we're trained. Uh, we, we do a lot of training and we do this many times a year. Uh, after one and a half minutes, a trained CCU nurse is inefficient in the compressions. So some smart people developed things that we can use. And what one is the machine that you, you put on the patient's chest. You connect it to a tube of uh, oxygen or just air. And that will do the compressions and something called decompression as well. So it's very, very efficient. And it came. And I remember the first cardiac arrest I ran to. And we used this. It was horrible. It was very effective, but it was horrible. The sound made it totally unethical. And we came back, we saved the patient, we came back to the ward, and we had, had a really bad feeling in the stomach, all of us. We said, this is not right. This created a, a huge debate that went on here in the, the south of Sweden for a long time, because the machine was invented in Lund. Very, very good machine, I must say. And today, uh, that machine has uh, come to generation number three, and they have worked with the sound. So it's much, much better. That means that if we do something, if we put some sort of pressure, or what you would call it, or we inform them, we can actually change. But we have to do it. Someone has to take the issue. And there's always someone new buying a machine. And then that person quits. And then there's someone else doing this machine. And no one looks at the full total picture. So I think you need to have one person designated. OK, what about the sound when it's time for a tender? So I would like to conclude with uh, an urge that you spread this message. All of you, architects, acousticians, functional planners, and uh, hospital owners, doctors and nurses, wherever you are here, plan for a full activity with real people with five senses when you build. And remember that if we can plan for a ticking bomb <laughs> in the most stressful situation, I am absolutely sure that we can do it in every situation. Thank you. <laughs>